jurisdiction. Thank you so much, Kai. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers. I, I cannot see you back in the audience. Uh, could you turn up the light? I always find it useful to see the audience. I think this is a large audience, which means that the organization has been excellent at signed in. And, and I saw that when they picked me up, they even have an umbrella with them. Wonderful. Even despite the weather, because we used to have sunny weather when we met, uh, sorry, when we were back home and we thought that coming to Madrid would be just the same as in Albania, in, in Germany, sorry. But actually it's been just the other way around. It was raining here. You've been working all day and you were working yesterday, so I do not want to dwell. And so I think we would rather, after my presentation, after some of the ideas that I will um, explain, I would like to focus on the discussion, on the debate. This topic, which is universal jurisdiction and transnational justice. And I want to deal, deal with it from a technical point of view. Mentioning the document that was produced by the organizers, the principles on uh, universal jurisdiction from Madrid 2014, and which has, which is in line with the principles. And it is a transition from civil society, from the academia, producing documents that are of common interest. So first, I want to add a few remarks on that document, which was the starting point, that's my opinion, on how they understand universal jurisdiction for international crimes. Then, I want to compare this document to the new Spanish law that you all know. Well, you know it, but I had to read it to get familiarized with it. And I would like to add a few comments on Spanish law. And then I linked all these ideas with uh, transitional justice as a concept. This would be the, the, the bulk of my presentation. First, the document sent to me on Madrid's principles. That kind of documents, as I said, are important and may play a role in international uh, discussions or debates. Of course, it, it's highly dependent on the quality of the document and see if those documents that have no formal they are not formally binding, and uh, well, they are documents that we might think are soft law instead of a status or treaties. Well, if you want an impact, uh, well, they need to be convincing in their arguments, in their contents, and also we need to take into account the group of people who's produced them. Maybe you remember there was quite a large initiative was a, group, a bunch of people from the US, a group of people from the US working in Europe on a convention on crimes against humanity that found its way to the uh, United Nations. It was an initiative by Goldson and some others that was a thorough document and which had to do with international legislative powers. So, this could be thought as a political strategy. These are the documents that we can use. Because you might wonder, how can they impact on the debate beyond Spanish borders? We can have a proper UK version, properly translated, and you see how people, supporters, or other entities that work at the UN, and they can also send it to the UN, which is a paper. That, that's the kind of document it is. 
And so governments, those in power, need to make choices. Because some other people might, some, some governments might have ignored them. And this group of people from the US that I mentioned, who is behind the document, well, I think if they deem it fit, I think they could follow these Madrid principles, because this is a very important, significant idea. And the idea would be to add uh, uh, other colleagues from the US, Asia, uh, other experts that have a name on uh, international criminal law scene. And then the document is even weight here. It starts from a concept that is universal jurisdiction. And we see that in the first principle, where the concept of universal jurisdiction is defined, which is just right. Again, I have no money. I'm I'm sorry. No, 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 no credit card. Nothing. I have nothing on me. Principle number one: fundamentals of universal jurisdiction, which is very important. That definition is very important. That concept, and of course, it is a okay. It's a correct definition because universal jurisdiction has no link, no sorry, no connection to uh, the state exercise in such jurisdiction for uh, some crimes. But what crimes are we talking about? What are the crimes that can be subdued to universal jurisdiction? And it says uh, some crimes, but what crimes are those? Principle number two says there are three different types of crimes, international law, transnational crimes, and serious, serious crimes under international law, and also financial crimes, which is way too wide. It is broad-based, and so we cannot think that all those principles, sorry, all those crimes and the principle two that are listed here, maybe they are not based on international law. They are just based on European law. Europe is Europe, but we are not the world. We are just a few, and we are small compared to the rest. So, principle number three, Three tells about the idea of an absolute or a limited universal jurisdiction, which conceptually is okay. This idea of absolute universal jurisdiction means that there's no limitation, there's no requirement, and the state has jurisdiction over some crimes, still remains to, to be defined what crimes, but that's enough, no need for anything else. They have jurisdiction, whereas limited universal jurisdiction has a presence requirement, which is all the consequence of case law, um, that it's under academic discussion. Presence as a requirement for universal jurisdiction is a procedural requirement, and that's to be found in many procedural laws. For example, in my home country, Germany, this is part of our procedural law. In order to have a material concept, uh, then, and according to principle number one, there is no need for connection or presence. So, if I'm not mistaken, universal means that it is universal without additional requirements such as nationality, territoriality, etc. But principle three, in my opinion, in this document, Madrid document, takes the nature of crimes into account. We have all those crimes on principle number two, and then principle number three says, if it is absolute, then only for international law crimes, serious crimes against nature and 
financial crimes and limited universal jurisdiction is used for transnational crimes, which is a bit shocking because you're mixing up different types of crimes under absolute universal jurisdiction. International crimes, per se, are those of uh, under Article 5 of Rome Statute, war crimes, for example. This is another consensus. We find states are obliged to prosecute those crimes. We are talking about Casco Rodriguez and the Inter-American Court that's been a leader in the field. But as for financial crimes or serious attacks on nature, it's not in existence. There is no case law and there is no international basis or customary law or anything of the like. They are very different in their severity, in the damage caused, and also the recognition in international law and international community. So they cannot be under the same umbrella. You cannot cover with absolute universal jurisdiction for serious international crimes and attacks on nature, although it is a bit uncertain. What, what's a serious attack on nature? What about war crimes? If you're familiar with Article Number 8 at the Rome Institute, uh, we have this war crime known as uh, causing unproportional damages to nature because of a military attack. But nobody knows what a disproportionate damage is. And that's a war crime according to Article Number 8. Here, they refer to serious attacks on nature, which could be small in scope or very large. For example, a nuclear plant accident has consequences on nature. What about uh, oil spill, such as with Texaco, or small nothings? This needs to be further defined. Then financial crimes that have an impact on fundamental rights, still not well defined, a bit blurred. What, what does it mean? Well, here there are wide scope concepts used and it is difficult for states or academics to, to accept this because academic people think that these crimes need to be indact indactable at a world level. So they need to be covered by absolute universal jurisdiction. This is something we need to look into. And according to Madrid Declaration, where we need to see the relationship between definition and the crimes and the principle two, also in accordance with the rules of universal jurisdiction. Then, principle number five, enforcement of the principle of universal jurisdiction without it being included in the national code or law. Well, I understand you were brave because according to the new law in Spain, there's no universal jurisdiction anymore. And so that when there is no legal basis in Spanish law, when judges are ruling, and so it has to come from international law. According to this, judiciary authorities in the states need to enforce the universal jurisdiction principle without it being included in their domestic law as long as the crime prosecution is an international obligation for the aforementioned state. So in reference to the international law, we see an abdication of international law, which is questionable for constitutional matters where we have civil law, like in Spain or, or Germany, because we all want a an, national law following international law. That's the question. 
What's that obligation? Where does it come from? What does international law about how countries are obliged to prosecute crimes? Well, maybe we need to think of war crimes such as genocide or crimes against humanity and see what duties are imposed on, 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 on countries. And well, there are other crimes, maybe terrorism, which is also international crime. This is arguable, but beyond that, everything is questionable. And so there is no consensus within states and, and also at an international level and even natural entities. So, according to international law, what are the duties of states for the prosecution of criminals? When discussing about universal jurisdiction, it's a, it's a bit misleading. Well, on the one hand, you might have a duty in, in a country to do something according to the criminal law and maybe in their prosecution law. And then we need to see if they are entitled or if they are empowered to do so. There's quite a difference, a clear difference. And so there is duty on the one hand versus power or right on the other hand. With such a distinction, we need to think of the new law in Spain, whether it is lawful or not, in the light of international law. Then we have principle number six, paragraph number two says that the judiciary who enforce universal jurisdiction will not be connected to these positions issued by a different state when we are talking about prescription, amnesty, immunity, etc. If we have a state with jurisdiction, doesn't matter what type of jurisdiction, it could be based on passive personality, so victims of the state or active personality, in any case, such a state, and that was the case in Germany with several cases, they use ex foreign, that is the state's law. If I say Spain has jurisdiction over extraterritorial facts, because they have their Spanish law, well, but still it's not connected or bound to rules or prescription from foreign law. This is a consequence of application of Lex Fori. It's not a consequence of criminal law or international law. This idea of jurisdiction, which opens a way to a state to enforce its own criminal law for a given situation which is not territorial, which is by then extraterritorial, at the same time empowers the state to enforce their own criminal law, its own criminal law, which means its own rules on immunity, amnesty, pardon, but not the, the rules and standards of another state, the state where the crimes been committed. Such a statement, that it's principle number six, paragraph number two, that's not necessary actually, it is just a consequence of this name jurisdiction. The problem in all discussion is, well, do we have this concept uh, jurisdiction and is it universal, that adjective, which is controversial, but still, what are the criteria for the enforcement of that concept? There are a few things that I added to the document uh, that I refer to the organizers. Uh, the thing is, we, we do not have much time, and there are a few comments on the remark, and, and I can send it and refer it to the organizers for them to take them into want if they, if they want. And to keep moving on, I would like to refer to Spanish law. 
this new legislation? Well, the first thing that we ask ourselves as a foreigner, and of course, not very much familiarized with a political context in this country, political background, is the following. Why the Spanish government wants to limit its universal jurisdiction? And then I read the reasons that will be the rational approach of a German person. So that is to say, to look into the reasoning. And then in this uh, reasoning, well, which takes one and a half pages, it says in the most important part, the extending or the scope of international jurisdiction beyond the frontiers going into the scope of the sovereignty of another state should be circumscribed to the scope foreseen by the international law. And that might be assumed by Spain in accordance to the international commitments. Extending the universal jurisdiction beyond its territory must be justified and made legitimate by the existence of an international treaty authorizing or foreseeing it with the consensus of the international community. Well, that sounds very well in principle, because the lawmaker says that everyone will applaud the government, and everyone will say, well, finally, the Spanish government wants to act within the framework of international law. This is, these are the grounds. This is the reasoning. If we read it literally. And then the government in its reasoning is saying we want to reform Spanish law taking into account or based on international law. No one could say that that is a bad idea. However, the other question is about the enforcement of the idea within the law. And here, obviously, the first thing that we find is that this law has a false name. So, because it is no longer about universal jurisdiction. So, I very much agree with what it says, Madrid principle. Universal jurisdiction is, universe, is jurisdiction with no connection. So, if I make a law and then I state many, many requirements to uh, enforce the jurisdiction, national, um, well, nationality, Spanish nationality, victim of uh, Spanish crimes. Well, I have everything. Of course, I have all those requirements, but they are unrelated to universal jurisdiction. Well, that is a law on jurisdiction, which is, at the end of the day is, the, is a law that is putting an end to the universal jurisdiction. Then we may argue whether it is timely, politically speaking, to stop or to put an end to universal jurisdiction from Spain. But actually, as a factor, as the law is replacing universal justice based on with classical criteria. So it is not the counter-reform that we know from other countries, but jurisdictional counter-reform. That comes from 2009, because the first amendment of the law was conducted when the Socialist Party was in power. Correct me if I'm wrong. So following the first amendments that put forward three requirements, presence in Spain, connect, relevant connection, and victims should be in Spain. So that put a limit to universal jurisdiction at that time. It was not such an explicit limitation as it is this time. The other thing that I discussed about that law with several colleagues and yesterday, we had a seminar in Göttingen with a professor on the topic. Well, the methodologically speaking, the, legis the legislative techniques that the lawmaker is applying is interesting. It is the one and only law that I'm aware of that has a case-based or cause-based approach. Approach, and as you know, the law is, you know, is reflected in five pages. And the approach is not a general approach, 
Well, well, the, no, with that reasoning, perhaps could have only have referred to international treaties forcing or, or in, imposing or making mandatory for Spain to apply or to enforce universal jurisdiction. However, the law doesn't do that. The law rather does what I uh, use as a casuistic case law method from common law. So let us say that from A, from letter A to letter R, it lists offenses or court or crimes, court crimes, terrorism, and finishing off with human rights trafficking, bribery, corruption, crimes. Oh, what happened? Is there any resistance against my my my, my speech, my lecture? Now that the music is. Uh, you are playing music. Well, I'm surprised because actually you invited me to come to this uh, forum. So, letter P. Oh, the law starts off with A, number four, genocide, crimes against humanity, crimes against the protected people. So, it starts with core crimes. So this is, well, this is a difficult uh, word, in, so to speak. Or, and then it finishes off with the general clause for remission that already existed in the organic law since 1984. And we also have that in Spain. It says, fight a crime whose prosecution is mandatory according to a treaty in force for Spain or other normative acts from an organization. So this remission clause could be enough for a law that intends to act in accordance to international law, as it says in its reasoning. So this clause is well known in Spain. It existed in Spain before, and we also have it in Spain, in Germany. Why the lawmaker didn't do that? Well, my question perhaps is a bit naive because I'm not aware of the actual reasons. Perhaps you could illustrate me on that. I believe that the lawmaker has a number of vested interests. On the one hand, the interest of limiting jurisdiction well, quote unquote, universal, because we know that it is not longer universal, but let us say territorial jurisdiction from Spain or the crimes that are of interest of us, that is to say, war crimes. That is to say, it limits the limitation of uh, the jurisdiction. Because on A, imagine the situation. If there is a crime, if a crime is committed, such as genocide, a war crime. Spain, according to this law, only has jurisdiction. Well, the author or the suspected person is a Spanish person or a person who is granted the nationality later on, later in time. It is not even a passive personality. The law does not allow prosecution of these crimes committed against the Spaniards. So there is no passive personality. Well, in Germany, this is a general principle of the uh, principle of jurisdiction. We have the passive personality. So therefore, so the situation in Spain is even worse. So this is the case for the journalist that was killed in Iran, in Iraq. So there is, mm, there is no personality, passive personality in this Spanish law. If a Spaniard is victim of a crime against humanity, in Spain there is no jurisdiction for that, despite that fact should have a base on international law, in international jurisdiction. So let us say in that case would be a less controversial case of universal jurisdiction. So therefore, lack of protection of Spaniards outside Spain 
took me aback because here there is a problem. So there is a lack of obligation by the state to protect the citizens. So I don't accept, I don't enforce jurisdiction in cases of crimes against my nationals. So perhaps this could work within the European Union because we have the principle of mutual trust, where we say, OK, well, uh, Germans could prosecute, uh, well, the perpetrators, if one of my nationals is a victim of a crime. But imagine the case of a Spaniard that was killed in Iran, Afghanistan, where no protection is offered. So I think that beyond international law, it's a problem of a constitutional problem. So that is to say the effective protection that the Spanish Constitution in Article 24 gives uh, the right to the citizens and the general obligation of each state of law to protect its nationals whenever their rights have been breached. So this is, a, uh, that was for genocide, for severe crimes. Well, of course, Due to some uh, time issues, I cannot really go through all the crimes, but I would just would like to highlight the technical issues of that law. So I said that there was a political criminal interest on the part of the government. Only by interpreting this law, the interest is not prosecuting international crimes, but prosecuting terrorism. That's highly interesting. Regarding terrorism, according to uh, letter uh, paragraph E, the lawmaker gives uh, eight criteria under which Spanish justice has jurisdiction. Amongst others, victims of a Spanish nationality, that is to say pe passive personality, and whenever the crime has been committed to influence or to condition in an illicit manner the activities of the Spanish authorities. So this is a literal copy of the Convention on Terrorism, but this is the typical definition of a conduct that should not be part of a jurisdictional rule, because here we have a jurisdictional rule only. This description that I've just read, that apparently the lawmaker copied from an anti-terrorism anti-terrorist convention means or implies that the judge of the prosecutor should do, should analyze the subjective elements of the crime. I repeat, the person must have committed the crime to condition in an illicit manner. So there is a subjective element in here because this is not possible. But when it comes to jurisdiction, the information that the national justice has or evidence is minimum. It has no information about the negligence or the intent. So this causes a technical problem. Number six, again, comes back to talk about terrorism. OK, they had good enough imagination or fantasy to talk about terrorism. Crime, whenever crime has been committed about an institution or an institution or European institution who's, that has its seat in Spain. What does that mean? It means that only there is only jurisdiction for terrorist acts against bodies, national bodies in Spain. Well, perhaps the European Commission has an office in Madrid, but actually the ants, actual European institutions in Spain. So, so this will be, well, we said any which will be wider than any crime committed against any 
universal institution that creates jurisdiction for Spain. That will be the broader interpretation. However, it is not clear from this uh, rule number eight what it meant. Actually, but what it is uh, clear regarding this rule or norm about terrorism is that the lawmaker extends or broadens the connections, the links, the criteria to trigger jurisdiction to be enforced in cases of acts of terrorism. The lawmaker includes acts such as repression of Caesar or aircrafts, uh, acts against the uh, aviation security, uh, possession of nuclear material, crimes of constitution or belonging to organized crimes or organizations. And then J, that refers to J. So this is a jurisdictional base for criminal groups or criminal organizations or crimes committed by groups that want to commit a crime in Spain. Well, if you say, well, if you are talking about the commission of the crime in Spain, we have the territorial principle. Well, then what happens? You were talking about extraterritorial. So if the crime is committed in Spain, obviously we have Spanish jurisdiction based on territoriality. So this doesn't, this is not very meaningful. Well, we assume good faith and um, in the of the lawmaker. Perhaps the lawmaker wants to say that any crime that is constituted or financed or that is integrated within an international crime organization. And that group is based in Spain, but may get finance from Germany, Syria, Afghanistan. But the group has connection, because the idea of the link and the, that of connection is very clear in the Spanish law. And well, that's what gives me jurisdiction. That could be a possible interpretation, a more reasonable interpretation. And then, well, we also have some surreal things, such as letter L, crimes, Council of Europe, 11 of May. Spain did not ratify that. Well, 10 of April, yes, it was ratified, but it will come into force the 1st of August. The lawmaker anticipated, or rather, I guess, I imagine, I don't know how things go in Spain, perhaps the lawmaker put that on the law to pressure the other lawmakers so that the Council or that convention was ratified. So that's another problem. If the lawmaker says, based on international law, well, don't you think that the European, the European law isn't it international law? So here, lots of criminal or European criminal law is enforced based on European Union directives regarding human trafficking, um, human trafficking. So perhaps that hasn't got a basis in international law. It's, well, there is a European uh, law. There are 27 member states. So we cannot really uh, pretend we, don't, we shouldn't try to make international law on the basis of U European law. And then now the crime of corruption. So jurisdiction for corruption crimes by Spaniards or against foreigners living in Spain. So an Argentine and a German person living in Spain. Again, that is active personality, traditional connection. 
There are many things uh, to comment on. I can send in my comments, my feedback, but I would like also to draw your attention on verbatim 5 of the law. In addition to the criteria for all the crimes listed under norm number four, there is a principle of subsidiarity that is introduced in here. And then article number 17 of the Rome Statute is copied literally. So this is, well, interesting. You could go and say, well, what is the relation? Is that related to Spain? A copy. So I compare it to the Spanish version of the Rome Treaty, and it is an actual copy. So where the CPI, well, another, well, penal, International Penal Court takes care of that, we are outside of it. We leave it up to the international justice. Second idea, what can we do with those states that are not serious in terms of acting against those crimes? And this is not limited to the crimes under Rome statute, because the voting number five refers to all the crimes that were sta stated under norm number four. So therefore, this principle of subsidiarity that is introduced in this law applies generally to the crimes that the lawmaker considers to be to have been committed outside the territory, taking into account the limitations that are stated in this law. Well, perhaps an state that has jurisdiction, perhaps this is the view of the lawmaker. For instance, they take the case of a state OK, well, I would not refer to them as states. OK, state X, OK? State X, the fictional, it does not exist, that actually protects criminals. And then the lawmaker says, well, we use the article number 7, we enforce article 17, Roman statutes, paragraph Number two and number three, literally copied in here. If that were to make sense, we could discuss it. And actually, when we developed, when we produced the Rome Statute, we took into account the relationship between the CPR, ICC, and the states. And Spain is a state as Germany as any other states. And he is, enters into relationship with other states where our rules are enforced. So there is an equality between states, and that's why we have immunity rules that have to be enforced. So the question is whether the rule of the Rome Statute that was drafted were to establish or to, to uh, yeah, the relationship between states. So the question is whether that rule could be applied in the laws between different states. So what do they mean by this? What is the intention of this amendment? Then verbatim 6 in this law introduces a limitation on civil action, which is, uh, well, included in the, uh, in the Spanish Constitution. Actio Popularis uh, has uh, enjoyed lots of it has been always been legitimate here in Spain. So the lawmaker wants to, well, wants to, uh, well, the public prosecutor to take care. So actual popularity is limited, and it only leaves a small door open for the victims to bring the case against the court. This is a restriction of the article number 125 of the Spanish Constitution on the one hand. And on the other hand, this is international practice. Once more, well, in the states, we have the official principle, that is to say the state through the public prosecution or any other prosecution body assumes these cases, especially the cases of international crime. There is, there, we find that in the common law. 
So states are interested in prosecuting those crimes. So there is, uh, well, there might be some kind of controls on the part of the state. And actually, well, as you know, in Belgium, the action popularis was limited after the Sharon cases, Mr. Sharon cases. In many of the states, and especially in the European Union states, well, the private individuals do n are not empowered to initiate cases of this nature. And not least, the civil society are empowered to do so, for instance, the NGO representing victims. Well, they are representative of victims. They are not actual victims. So I believe that the lawmaker is following a trend that we see in comparison law and then in most of the jurisdiction. Well, I am interested in hearing your opinion. I know that in Spain there is a debate about actual popularism that it would be interesting perhaps to compare it to other European Union countries or Latin American countries within the common law system. Finally, the law includes a transitory provision under which all the claims that are being processed when the law comes into force will be dismissed up until the fulfillment of the requirements under the law is proven or fulfilled. So there are several problems here. First of all, the speed of the law. The law came into force the next day after it was published here. The law was uh, drafted very fastly. And here we can see that the intent of the purpose was not only to shorten or limit extraterritorial jurisdiction for the future, but also in a retrospective manner. That is to say, affecting the causes that were being processed by the Spanish judiciary. So it is not clear, well, this case, this law does not does not specify which courses uh, should be uh, dismissed. So the principle perpetuatio jurisdictione. So for instance, if there is a case uh, the Spanish criminal course cannot be dismissed because it is already being uh, worked on or, or, or dealt with by the judge. The judge has being taken care of this case for, 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 for years. So you cannot really avoid it. You cannot really dismiss it. But here it says that you have to prove, you have to verify according to this law that the requirements, that is to say that the traditional classic connections are there in order to enforce Spanish jurisdiction. I also see here a big problem regarding the effective protection. From the viewpoint of the victim that at that time, according to the previous legislation, initiated or brought case against, and now the uh, basis for jurisdiction is removed retrospectively. So this is a big problem and, of course, questionable. Well, these are some of my comments about this law that perhaps we could discuss. And we could summarize this law as a law that replaces universal jurisdiction uh, based on classical criteria. Spain, according to that law, stops, is no longer an active player, or rather, in the face of international crimes. This is the greatest concern that we have. This is the key point. Spain limits its jurisdiction in court crimes. And that's where the problem, the problem lies. This shows lack of 
willingness on the part of the government. Well, we could say that the government is proving that it doesn't have the will to prosecute international crimes. So the same criteria that is included in this law by copying the Article 17, paragraph number 2, is realizing it through law. So counter -argument, arguments now, because I don't want, well, well, I'm here in Spain, and I have to accept the uh, diplomatic rules and to defense the, go defense the government of Spain. Well, we could go and say, well, to go back to the topic of authority, empowerment. So international law does not impose states to prosecute crimes that were committed extraterritorially. So, well, international law empowers or confers that right. But, and it is also clear, and here I uh, would like to criticize the Madrid principle documents, the Lotus case before the First World War. I don't know whether you are aware of the case. Uh, Turkish vessel clashes or clashes with a French vessel at the high seas where there is no jurisdiction. Several Turkish sailors died and the Turkish uh, vessel was completely destroyed and then the French went to Istanbul together with the rest of the Turkish staff. And then the Turkish arrested the French on in Turkey, and they were investigated and they were prosecuted. The case was took from France by the Permanent Court of Justice, that was before the International Court of Justice, and the court ruled to summarize, well, the it's very long ruling, said that the extension of use pudendi, of that is to say the enforcement of criminal law always entails interference of uh, in the matters of the state that is affected. This is just an extension of crimes in committed extraterritorially. So if Spain extends its criminal law to crimes that were committed in other states uh, that starts off with the letter C, such as Chile, if that extension implies intervention in the internal affairs of the state, because that state has territorial jurisdiction. It is its territory. The state says, I have the jurisdiction. And some colleagues says that territorial jurisdiction, it is the strongest jurisdiction of youth and of the sovereignty of the state. Well, when they enforce the criminal law. So you could say that that state has more right to prosecute the crimes in its own territory than a third state. If this is so, and if that was confirmed in the Permanent uh, Court of Justice in the Lotus case, if the extension of criminal jurisdiction of us, of Germany, of Spain, of all the countries, to other states implies intervention or interfering in the self-determination of that state over its territory, we need connection or legitimation. And here, that's where the genuine leaks idea comes from. So Lotus says we really need a genuine link, a connection. So in the reasoning of this law, well, the lawmaker fully agrees with international law in this regard. So the question is, in the case of international crimes, if the same facts of international crime 
crime, genocide, torture, etc. If it has an impact on the international community, and if this is the reason why the state prosecuting the crimes is acting on behalf of the international community, that would be the justification. So in the Madrid document, there is a justification that said there, is, there are no problems in times of sovereignty, because here we are acting in the defense of uh, human rights, interest of the international community when we prosecute those crimes. And that's the reason why the state with the territorial jurisdiction cannot apply sovereignty. So we have to be very honest here. So this is the argument used by the Supreme Court in Argentina of all our European uh, jurisdictions and as well as the Latin American jurisdictions. But we, well, of course, well, Chinese and the Asians do not uh, share uh, these. Russians do not share that either. Many states do not share that. Many of uh, states defend the position or have the position. So this is very clear in the case of Spain uh, versus Tibet. Well, the state says this is an internal affair. This is an internal issue. Even if it is an international crime, I don't care. I, have a I am a state, I have sovereignty, and I have jurisdiction. So therefore, ju sovereignty prevails. It's in force. I don't think this is correct. We in the Western world, based on uh, international criminal law, Rome statute, etc., etc., and all the documents and instruments that were produced, justify the extension, extraterritorial extension of international law, which at the same time is smaller than the military law. But obviously, we should not overlook those arguments and make the mistake and thinking that whether we are acting well, thinking that or think that in the US they all think like that or in Europe everyone thinks like that. Well, to counteract those arguments and what it's most important, and now I'm going back to the start of my presentation. Crimes allowing universal jurisdiction should be clearly defined. And I think that the concept of Madrid's declaration, principles one and two, are too broad. Well, it is a very generous definition of universal jurisdiction, including crimes or, uh, or damages or harm against the environment. So it is not, uh, I don't think it is a good idea. OK, I will be finishing now. So we should think further about it. We should think strategically about that. Well, uh, there are issues to be open to debates. Thank you so much for listening, for your patience. I'm open to questions and to the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, and to thank you for your initial remarks. And as a draft, I have to say that this has been changed and it's been amended and corrected. But it seems that we were in a mental connection. Uh, there was some kind of connection with us, because some of your remarks are already included in our updated documents, at least today. And it will be ready tomorrow. And we will try to improve it with your input. And we've tried to make it even more concrete. 
much more specific. And I think all the comments you've you've added go in in in, in line with that. And uh, yes, uh, we would like to take active part. The initial idea would be to have the mix summoned and supported and voted on by personalities that are here in the audience and some others that could not attend, but who, well, will get it referred and the target would be to make that extra effort. As for the criticism, On the on the non-universal jurisdiction in Spain, well, they are common, and and I think they they improve what we've been doing, and somehow they match. As you've broken it down, it is even more in accordance. One of the problems when terrorism is discussed, uh, and that got your attention. Well, the thing is, terrorism in Spain, and especially from a point of view of the Popular Party, is given names and surnames, and so it is thought of globally and not internationally, sorry, locally and not internationally. And so when we think of passive personality, it is used for some types of terrorism. But in the document itself, they forget about the principle when it is about a terrorism which is different from domestic or indigenous terrorism. Yeah, that's true. This law has not supported universal jurisdiction. Yeah, right the opposite. And so, when there's an extension to different crime types, it is a fake. It is a fail, actually. We see a restriction with contradictions and how it is examined in the law. And in the end, it ends up contradicting everything that it's been set out before when it is adjusted to limitations and say, that it's in reference to those conventions that Spain's enter into, when they are actually breaking them one after the other. There are a few questions. There's one about the name of this paper where we talk about transitional ju jurisdiction and universal jurisdiction. They say, historically speaking, International courts have been related to some measures of trans transitional justice. So, the enforcement of universal jurisdiction, do you think we should use the remedy principles or victim rights principles of those societies that have come out of a conflict? As for example, how can we have these rights safeguarded in processes that have been started or initiated in third party or third countries? This is one of the questions. There is another question with an initial remark. Global economy is eroding democracies, especially brittle democracies. So what crimes will be prosecuted when enforcing universal jurisdiction if, on the one hand, international criminals are going unpunished, uh, so they are finding no punishment, and so how will they be prosecuted down the, the way for financial crimes? If they are not judged because of this, which is even more serious, how can we expect them to be prosecuted for lesser criminal acts? And I think uh, with all those questions, uh, we gather all the, the, the doubts in the audience. Well, first of all, Something else on Spanish law, which, well, I thought for you and for other people in the audience, the most important part would be to look into the law and its principles, because that's the future ahead of us. I think uh, the law can be summarized into two sentences. Law, Spanish law, 
sets out a contradiction or opposition between state international crimes, those are the typical international uh, state crimes such as macro criminality or crimes against humanity, and there, there's clearly limitation of jurisdiction. And then, what would call private crimes, such as terrorism or drug dealing, which is all organized crime. Those crimes that we've always thought of as second rank crimes in the hierarchy of crimes. And their jurisdiction is extended. This is a clear contradiction in Spanish law. So it's a good way to attack the law on, based on its inconsistencies beyond the fact whether you agree or not with the universal jurisdiction, whether it is absolute or not, and the legal practices in our states, which is always very limited in its nature, because the uh, prosecutors out of place have some limitations. But what's important here in order to change the law, to amend the law, and I think there will be papers in Spain by experts de with a detailed examination of law. There are many loopholes, there are many errors, technical errors. It's not about discussing whether we are for or against the law, because there will always be defects in this law. That means that uh, they need to be repealed or reformed, and so there will be a counter-counter reform. That's the final outcome. And that's another way I have to apologize, because I didn't refer to transitional justice, because, well, I thought it is such a, a wide topic. And, and you all know this is a, a topic that you cannot discuss in short time. And uh, when choosing between these two topics, I thought that uh, talking about the law, which is the Spanish reality, was a bit more important. There's something else that the law doesn't touch upon, and that is uh, Franco's regime. The law doesn't say anything about what should be done, what needs to be done for the crimes committed under Franco's regime, because it's a matter of territoriality, and that's what's interesting. So, law cannot narrow down jurisdiction because those crimes have been committed in Spain. So, it is a matter of jurisdiction, but maybe this law that has a different underlying political agenda, which is not just uh, the, the idea to please uh, Chinese people or s stay in agreement with American people. Actually, there's another underlying agenda that is the, to forget or, or leave Franco's regime into ob oblivion, make as if it had never happened. But it has no impact on Franco's regime, because there, Spain has jurisdiction from the very crime committed under Franco's regime. There's no excuse or jurisdictional excuse not to look into those crimes. And so it is also important for the political discussion or debate. And I think we, German people, we can say so, and we are in a position to say so, because we are had Thousands of proceedings, actually, nowadays, we're still prosecuting Nazis. Nazis. I, I don't uh, want to make comparison here because I think Nazis were much, much worse, but still, we, we did so, and we have been doing so, and even today we have proceedings against uh, former custodians or guardians of uh, those concentration camps that are 85 years, uh, who are 85 years old now, and even in dictatorship in Eastern Germany, we have open proceedings. In we use criminal law as a foundation, as a principle. And maybe that's because we're German, because we German people, we are principle-based. That's the way we are. And then we see the connection with transition of justice. We've never used this term. 25 years ago, when we had the Max Planck conference, uh, this was right after the reunion of Germany, and Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which is translated as overcoming the past. And was it through criminal law? And there was a question mark there. So what's the role of criminal law when discussing the past? 
what was then known as a transitional justice, which was the name given by a German um, colleague, which was as actually a new as imposition, because uh, transitional justice was discussed 10 years ago, or Eastern Europe, well, we have the worst of agreement, the, 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 the wall fall. Those topics were thought of uh, rationally. The, the idea, the rational idea is what crimes have been committed? Well, what happened on the fascism? Uh, what's your response to all this? Do you want to sacrifice justice in favor of something else? Such in a peace keeping process in, in Colombia? Or do you want to enforce criminal law? A, a, a little bit of fate. And so for us, in the European debate, which started in Germany, it was not so much about the concept or what the name to give it, a translational post-conflict justice. Actually, this person, this someone who doesn't like transitional, transitional justice because it's a misnomer quite often. It's usually used for Argentina, Chile, Spain, Germany. But we aren't in transition anymore. We are democracy now. And we find ourselves in a post-dictatorship situation. We had dictatorship in 1945, and then until 89 in the East part. And then there are democracies, which might be defective, but it is a dem democracy, which is different from Libya or Syria, where they're still in transition. Or in a transition to come, or Afghanistan, where transition has not come yet. So we used to have a system, we have a system, a legal system that, that's working, that's not been destroyed and is empowered to the things as we see with other things. If we're talking about uh, organized criminality, terrorism, or similar crimes, it does work, our system. So we need to make a choice as a state, as a society, and decide. That's the argument. How do we want to face past crimes in our home countries? And I'm talking about my country, not as, uh, about Spain, but me as German. I've always thought, and I think my criminal expert friends and other uh, experts in, in Germany, and judges in Germany, uh, we cannot leave some, some, some crimes go unpunished. So, we have people who are 86 years old, they, they come in a wheelchair to the hearing, and this is Leaño, and he was just uh, accessory to crime in a concentration camp out of Germany. And the coercion, well, that's, that's questionable. Is it worth it? Because he is not the head of the concentration camp at Auschwitz, who was prosecuted long ago, 20 years ago, in Auschwitz uh, uh, proceedings that we all know. But this is a basic question. <coughs> We've had two dictatorships that we got rid of, our kids. We, all of us in school, we learn about Hitler and about the crimes under his regime during 89 by Stasi. I learned it myself, my kids learned it, even to the point where they say, I'm fed up, I don't want to hear about Hitler anymore. Everyone talks about Hitler, but that's all, that's always been our commitment. We've always been faced with this reality. We didn't hide it under the carpet. You can visit concentration camps, you can go to numerous uh, court, everything is out there, everything is transparent. That's the way we face our past. We, with our uh, president now, who is a well-known representative and who is a portrait of that line of thought, a society cannot grow under a lie, not based on a lie. Based on a lie, we cannot have a society grow. We cannot have that society when there are still people who deserve some treatment according to a truth commission or criminal law and still are living amongst us and even holding an office in society. And victims might find perpetrators out in the street. That cannot be the case. Uh, maybe we are a bit harsh, uh, you might think so, but for us, 
transitional justice, overcoming the past. For that, you need to have some criminal law element. The idea is, what we can argue is, the amount of criminal law that is going to be enforced to achieve peace of, peace of mind. That's what we need in the country. In, uh, Colombia could be different from what we have in Germany, but of course it, it, it is what we need to discuss. Thank you very much. Well, here, yeah, we think it should be the case, but our Supreme Court did not only turn down this little bit of criminal law, but uh, the Truth Commission cannot be used, although it would be interested. Thank you very much for your presentation. We close his presentation here, and then in line with what's uh, being discussed right now, we will play the documentary, Footprint of Grandparents, referring precisely to Franco's regime, historical memory, and impunity of Franco's regime and how it this story is understood by a third generation. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have the documentary played. If you want to stay, you have five minutes to use the restroom and let the people who are outside come into the room, because then we start playing the video.